Welcome back to the deep dive. Today, we are going deep, and I mean really deep, into the literal architecture of intelligence. We're looking at the inner workings of these huge, large language models. Yeah, we're going into the engine room. We're going to talk about how you build these things, these uh, massive, deep networks, without them just completely falling apart during training. Right. If you imagine an LLM as this towering skyscraper of logic, we're looking at the actual joints and the bolts holding it all together, layer after layer. And our mission for this deep dive is to unpack a really elegant solution from DeepSeek AI. It's called Manifold Constrained Hyperconnections, or MHC for short. And we're going to see how MHC fixed a, well, a pretty serious instability crisis that was threatening the next generation of these giant models. But to get there, we have to start at the beginning. We need to talk about the foundational tech that, you know, kind of made all of this deep learning possible in the first place. The standard residual connection, the resonant paradigm from, what, almost a decade ago now? That's the one. It's so simple on the surface, but it's fundamentally what keeps these things stable. When information passes through a layer, it usually gets processed and changed, right? Mm -hmm. But the residual connection adds a bypass a direct path, like an express lane. Okay, let's unpack this because this is the key to everything. This is what gives us that famous identity mapping property. Exactly. The math is basically six lawler plus one equals six lawler plus five lawler. So the output of the new layer is just the original input plus whatever new stuff the layer computed. That little six lawler as it gets passed through, that's the identity map. And why is that one little bypass path so incredibly important for a deep network? Because it guarantees the original signal, the core information, can get from a shallow layer all the way to a deep layer without being changed. Think of it like a perfectly clear pipe running straight at the skyscraper. So the information doesn't decay or get garbled over hundreds of floors? Precisely. It prevents the signal from vanishing or, just as bad, exploding. It's the secret sauce for stable learning. Okay, so residual connections are the stable foundation. But of course, engineers always want more, better performance. Always. Which brings us to the architecture that tried to push things maybe a little too far. Hyperconnections, or HC. This was our problem child. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. They were trying to boost performance by uh, basically enhancing the network's internal capacity. How? What did they actually change? Instead of that single simple pipe we talked about, HC widened the stream. So imagine that one pipe now becomes, say, four parallel pipes all flowing side by side, an expansion rate of four. And the goal of having four streams was what? A richer, more complex internal mixing of features. It increases the, you know, the topological complexity of the network without actually adding a ton more raw computation or FLOPs. It seemed like a really smart trade. There's always a but. To mix those four streams of information, they had to add something new. These learnable matrices, right? Yeah. The matrices? Yes. And that is exactly where it all went wrong. They added these matrices to control the mixing, but the design was totally unconstrained. And by unconstrained, you mean they lost the very identity mapping property that made everything stable in the first place? They lost it completely. How does that happen? How does just widening the stream and adding a little mixing matrix suddenly break the most important stability mechanism in deep learning? Because in a deep network, you're not just looking at one layer. You're stacking hundreds of them. The final effect is the composite of all those layers multiplied together. So you're multiplying all those unconstrained matrices together. And that product, mathematically, has no guarantee of being stable or bounded. You lose the conservation mechanism. The signal is just running wild. And when the signal runs wild, you get chaos. Total chaos. The signal magnitude either grows uncontrollably until it explodes, the gradients become infinite and training just crashes, or it shrinks down to nothing and it vanishes. So the deeper layers learn absolutely nothing. It's like a microphone feedback screech. Exactly. The system just screams to a halt. And the evidence they found when they tried this on a 27 billion parameter model was, uh, let's just say it was dramatic. The training was a mess. Unstable losses, sudden spikes out of nowhere. And they had a specific metric for this, right? The AMAX gain magnitude. The smoking gun. It measures how much the signal is amplified. For these unconstrained hyperconnections, the value peaked at around 3,000. 3,000. So the signal was being amplified by 3,000 times. At every layer. Imagine that. It's mathematically impossible for any system to handle that. The network was just completely out of control. So the math was a disaster. But it wasn't just the math. There was a practical hardware cost, too. Oh, a huge one. They ran straight into what's called the memory wall. 
The computation might have been efficient, but memory access, the I.O., is the real bottleneck in modern computing. And by widening the stream to four, they... They quadrupled the memory bandwidth they needed to feed the beast. It was efficient on paper, but in practice, it was a memory hog that just wouldn't scale. Okay, so we have a concept. Wide residual streams. That's promising for performance, but is killed by two things. Mathematical explosion and a hardware bottleneck. A total non-starter. Which brings us to DeepSeek AI's big idea, manifold constrained hyperconnections, MHC. What was the core insight here? The insight was that you can have your cake and eat it too. You just need to put a mathematical leash back on the system. So you impose constraints to get stability back, but you do it in a way that doesn't kill the performance benefits of that wide stream. Exactly. It's a smart constraint. They did it by taking that chaotic mixing matrix, the Walsh mm -hmm. and projecting it onto a very specific mathematical space, a manifold. And that manifold has a name that sounds incredibly complex, the Birkhoff polytope. It does sound complex, but what it does is actually very intuitive. It forces the mixing matrix to be something called doubly stochastic. Doubly stochastic. Okay, break that down for us. What does that mean in simple terms? It means perfect balance. Two rules. First, all the numbers in the matrix have to be non-negative. Second, and this is the key, every single row and every single column has to sum up to exactly one. Ah, okay. So the total amount of influence coming into a point and going out of a point is always perfectly conserved. It's always one. Precisely. It forces the whole operation to act like a physical mixing process. Think about mixing different colored paints. The total amount of paint you have at the end is the same as what you started with. You've just rearranged the proportions. I see. It's an inherently conservative process because of that perfect balance. And they use something called the Sinkhorn Knopf algorithm to enforce this. They do. It's an iterative process that nudges the matrix until it fits those doubly stochastic rules perfectly. But doesn't running an extra algorithm add a bunch of computational overhead? That's the critical question. And we'll get to how they made it efficient. But first, look at what this constraint buys you mathematically. There are three huge benefits. The pillars of stability. First is norm preservation. Because the matrix is perfectly balanced, its spectral norm is capped at 1. This immediately stops that 3000x signal amplification we saw. The gradient explosion problem. Solved. Okay, so it locks the door on the chaos. What's the second one? Compositional closure. This is maybe the most important part for a deep network. If you multiply two doubly stochastic matrices together, the result is also doubly stochastic. So when the signal travels through 100 layers and you're multiplying 100 of these matrices, the result is still stable and bounded. The stability holds across the entire depth of the model. It fixes the fatal flaw of HEC, which fell apart when you stacked layers. And the third pillar. The geometric interpretation. Yeah. Because of that paint mixing analogy, the whole operation is a convex combination of its inputs. This guarantees that the average value, the mean of the features, is conserved as it passes through. The signal propagation is perfectly well conditioned. Okay, so the math is fixed, the system is stable again. But what about that other killer problem, the hardware bottleneck? Did MHC solve the memory access issue? They absolutely had to. A stable model that runs too slowly is, you know, useless. And they tackled it with some really clever infrastructure design. And the result? The final implementation of MHC only had about a 6.7% additional time overhead, even with that expansion rate of 4, which is tiny. 6.7% overhead to fix a 3,000 times signal explosion is a trade I think anyone would take. So how did they pull that off? A few key techniques. The first was kernel fusion. The memory wall problem comes from making lots of separate small trips to memory to fetch data, which is slow. Right, the input-output bottleneck. So with kernel fusion, they bundled multiple operations that use the same data into a single unified compute kernel. Instead of four tiny, slow trips to memory, you make one big, efficient trip. It dramatically reduces the memory bandwidth pressure. Very clever. And they also did something about the memory footprint itself, right? Especially during the backward pass of training. Yeah, that's their use of recomputing or selective checkpointing. That wide four stream design uses a lot of GPU memory to store intermediate results during the forward pass. So to save that memory. They just throw those intermediate results away. And then when they need them for the backward pass, they just recompute them on the fly. So you trade a tiny bit of recomputation time later to save a huge amount of precious memory right now. Precisely. It's a classic space-time trade-off. Uh -huh. And they even calculated the optimal block size to make it as efficient as possible. And the last piece was communication. 
for training on these huge GPU clusters. Right. They adapted something called the dual pipe schedule. But the key extension was executing the big feed-forward network kernels on a dedicated high-priority compute stream. Meaning the heavy lifting doesn't get stuck waiting for data to be shuffled around. Exactly. It keeps the GPUs fully saturated and working, which is the name of the game in large-scale training. So we have fixed math and we have clever hardware engineering. Let's get to the moment of truth. The results. Did MHC actually deliver the performance without the instability? Unequivocally, yes. The stability validation is just, it's night and day. Remember we said HC's Amex gain magnitude peaked at a destructive 3000. A system completely out of control. With MHC, the maximum deviation in that same metric was tightly controlled. It peaked at about... 1.6. From 3000 down to 1.6. It's a reduction of three orders of magnitude. They took an unstable, chaotic mess and turned it into a predictable, well-behaved system. And that stability must have translated directly into better performance on their 27 billion parameter models. It did. The training loss was stable. The gradient norms were stable. It behaved just like the simple, traditional baseline. But crucially, it performed better. The MHC model achieved a final training loss that was 0 0.021 lower than the baseline. And lower loss means a better model. Did it show up on actual reasoning tasks? That's the real payoff. All that richer feature mixing actually worked now. MHC showed real gains on downstream benchmarks. It got a 2.1% gain on BVH and a 2.3% gain on DRAW-P compared to the original unstable HCC model. So the wide stream concept was good, it just needed the constraints to function. It needed the guardrails. And this advantage held up as they scaled. Ah, the scaling experiments. Yeah, they were conclusive. Whether they were training smaller 3B models, 9B, or the big 27B models, MHC consistently outperformed the standard baseline across different compute budgets. It's an architectural fix that actually scales. So wrapping this all up, what's the big takeaway for the future of LLMs? It seems like MHC is this general framework that uses some pretty fundamental math to enforce a property that deep networks just can't live without. That's it, exactly. It fundamentally proves that you don't have to choose between high performance from complex architectures and the stability you need to actually train these things. You can have both. You can have both, as long as you're rigorous and you put the right mathematical guardrails in place. It's really a testament to how structural integrity is just as important as raw power. A really elegant piece of work. And it leads to this one final fascinating question that the researchers themselves posed. MHC worked beautifully using the Birkhoff polytope, right? Forcing the matrices to be doubly stochastic. Right. But the framework they built is general. You could, in theory, constrain the matrix to other kinds of manifolds other geometric shapes with different properties. So they solved this problem, but they might have opened the door to a whole new field of architectural design. That's the provocative thought to end on. What other geometric constraints, beyond this idea of perfect balance, could unlock an even better trade-off between pl plasticity, that performance gain from complexity, and the essential stability we need for the next generation of models? That's the exciting new frontier we leave you with.